Hello, everybody, and welcome to Author Content. This is episode 30. I am Morton. With me, as always, I have my two co-hosts, James Williamson, who is sitting outside in his yard. It's and, beautiful. It's a beautiful day And me. And, and Ray Vigilobos, who is uh, like this. probably insulting someone in Greece by doing that. What? Uh, <laughs> And uh, our injuries. special guest, uh, Dave Hogue, who is back for a second Tama. <laughs> he did not learn from his first experience. I did not know. <laughs> I, I'm a slow learner, I suppose. Well, you know, like, you know what's weird? Like, last time Dave was here, I know that I, if you look at that podcast, I was so quiet because I was just, like, listening to everything he was saying the whole time. And then I realized, like, man, I didn't say anything like that a whole entire podcast, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> Because people probably need to hear him more than me, anyways. That's so the really nice to have you back. Smart. Dave's a smart guy. He's fun to listen to. Yeah, so it was actually really nice to be able to have him back. So welcome. Oh, back, thanks Dave. for the invitation. It's always a lot of fun talking with y'all. Well, I think what Ray was trying to tell you is that he's going to talk over you today. Yes. So no, I'm going to be no, I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to say much. <laughs> so just for the people listening, I didn't realize I was wearing this T-shirt today. So just so that it's clear. It's triple X root beer, <laughs> <laughs> not not something else. <laughs> and uh, and for the record, root beer is truly revolting. <laughs> what? I just have the T-shirt you don't like because root it's beer? funny. No, see, anyone that grew up outside of North America and then is exposed to that atrocity is like, why are you serving uh, me poison? You, you guys, what, you guys, you guys drink what rendered seal fat over there or something? I mean, what? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Rendered seal fat, um, whale skin soup, you know. Yeah. It's mostly... I have to say, like, the most annoying thing about Canada when I went there is that the, the, the Slurpees on the 7-Elevens don't have any carbonation, so it tastes really horrible. Wait, there's carbonation in the Slurpees? Yes, in, in America there is. Work? It's awesome. It's like you're Seriously? drinking a frozen soda. It's the best thing in the world. Yeah, you guys should, you come, <laughs> whenever you come visit us... <laughs> You should try one. Well, you know, if, as we're talking about uh, crimes against food, uh, you should come up to Vancouver and try what they call screamers. So this is like the, you know, it's, it's the worst atrocity ever committed against any kind of frozen <laughs> consumable. Do tell. Explain it is, what is it? It is Slurpees with ice cream globs inside. So it's like a Slurpee floaty. Okay. Sort of bad. Slurpee float. And when that stuff starts melting and mixing, it just turns into this horrible slurry that's like, oh, uh, yeah, it's, it's... There's a reason why it can only get in two places in all of BC. <laughs> so I, I, I suppose that, that you also don't like the idea of getting shave ice with ice cream in Hawaii. Mm. Or, oh, no, no, or that's like, fun. It's so good. That's different. This is like, that it is turns so into good. this horrible slurry. That's the problem. It's like this. <laughs> you know, the so, thing that got ruined for me when I went to Hawaii was I always had this this, uh, this thing about you know those those chilled coconuts and how how wonderful they look. Yeah. And then I had one, and they just <laughs> coconut water just doesn't do it for me. Yeah, coconut I'm not water a fan is... of coconut water. I I don't like the plain coconut water, but I love a fresh coconut. The... I'll I'll eat the insides out, but I don't like the water. There you go. The all the all my workout buddies, they're all gorging themselves on coconut water now and buying like pallets of it at Costco and Yeah, it's they go the, like, Hey, she wants some coconut water? No, no, I'll it's, just it's the latest fad. Water. I'm I'm sure we'll be I'm sure we'll be drinking fermented seal fat in another two years or something like that. It'll be another fad. <laughs> Man, so, this has turned uh, into a whole different kind of show, I think. <laughs> yeah, I didn't anticipate this at all when I logged in. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think that I think that there were actually things we were supposed to be talking about. So uh, that's right. So let's get to that. So um, Ray, uh, <coughs> before our hangout started, threw out this idea that we should talk about flat design. So seeing as you started that, maybe you should explain yourself. Well, you know, I think we've been talking about it for several weeks, and I think we had Dave here before sort of Apple made the big announcement that they were kind of doing their version of flat design. Yeah. And now I've seen it everywhere. It's been sort of around all the websites. Um, I think, I don't know, I, personally I think we're ready for it to change once again. 
But I really wanted to get Dave's opinion on it because I think he's obviously an expert in UI design. And, you know, I thought, man, we really need to invite him to just kind of get his thoughts on it. So what do you think, Dave? Okay. Good, bad? What's All your right. take on it? Um, yeah, well, obviously, I mean, if we, I think it, it helps actually to look more historically at, at the design and at trends rather than just what's happening right now. So if we go back, say, to 2007 when the iPhone first came out um, and, and when it employed a lot of these skeuomorphic characteristics, um, I, part of the reason that that may have been their design decision at that time was because the iPhone was, for most people, a new way of interacting with devices, a handheld touch screen. Now, granted, it wasn't the first touch device that people would have used. You know, the iPad wasn't the very first tablet that was ever out there. So touch screens had been around before. But the idea that you just had these little tiles, these little icons on the screen that were going to access functionality for you was a bit more abstract uh, in a touch screen environment. Where you don't have a keyboard. You don't have a mouse. There wasn't voice recognition. And so they were using the characteristics of, of the real world, you know, textures um, and, and lighting and, and shading characteristics, to give the impression, to create perceived affordances, to give the impression that this is something that you can touch and to invite interaction. Wait, wait stop touch. for a second. Say that again. Perceived affordances. Yes, perceived affordances. Um, that everyone talks. I love that. <laughs> everyone awesome. talks about, about uh, affordances. Um, affordances come from, in, in the late 70s, James Gibson and ecological psychology and how people understand their interactions with the physical world around them. Like we know that walking up a steep hill is going to take more energy than walking on flat land, things like that. Um, and when Don Norman wrote The Design of Everyday Things, actually the first edition of his book was called The Psychology of Everyday Things and the second edition was called The Design of Everyday Things. Um, and he was talking about using affordances in digital design. Um, and he, he introduced the world of, of UX to this concept. Uh, and so they've taken it and they've run with it. Um, he subsequently said, I, he uses the phrase perceived affordances, um, which I'm kind of glad that he does. Um, because affordances really, as they were originally defined, were about people's understanding of how they interact with physical objects. And, and the digital world is just light projected on a screen. It's not an actual physical object. It's a, it's a representation of one. And, and so the, phys the perceived affordance phrase means that it looks like something that we would understand how to interact with its actual physical counterpart in the real world. So digital buttons look like they are pressable because we have designed them to have, say, a three-dimensional characteristic, which is what a real physical button would have. Um, and so they, they were using the texture, they were using depth, they were using the skeuomorphic characteristics to invite people to interact in an, on a new device and through a new medium. Uh, and it was probably a good decision at the time. It was something that was very, very helpful. Uh, but what has happened since they've sold, I don't know what, you know, 8 billion I things in the past five years uh, or six years or whatever, that we've learned. You know, people learn. We, we take our past experiences with us, and now everyone understands how to interact with these flat touch screens. Um, flat meaning gl flat glass, not design flat. Um, and, and so we don't have to have as many overt cues to help people understand where to interact. They have learned how the device operates. Uh, and so Microsoft has taken one end of the spectrum, which is a very, very flat, you know, sort of Bauhaus, Swiss typography approach to things. Um, Google is somewhere in the middle. Google, I don't know if you've noticed recently, their, their updates to their icons uh, have actually pulled away from as flat as they were, and they've introduced mm -hmm. some things to them again. Um, and you're going to have view, which is from right above the object, looking down. So they're introducing some perspective and depth and a, and a little more texture into their icons. Um, and then we're about to see what iOS 7 is going to be doing. Um, definitely, we know... From the, from the betas and from the public uh, previews that they're moving in the flat direction, not as flat as Microsoft, maybe somewhere in the, in the Google flat range. Uh, but 
I think the the end reason, you know, we just don't need that many visual cues. So you're saying it's uh, basically just that now that we've been trained to behave a certain way, there's no point in making it skeuomorphic anymore. Right, right. You know, and and there are there are design trends. You know, we're just we're following a design trend. We're seeing more flat design everywhere. Apple is looking with with the iOS six and the old skeuomorphism. They're looking more and more outside of the trend. And face it, Apple is an organization that wants to stay on the forefront of of what is popular. That's what is going to continue to sell products and services for them. And if they're perceived as old or old fashioned or outdated or behind of the times, it's going to have an impact on their bottom line. Um, if everything else around you is flat except for the one thing that looks like linen and bark, well, then you're going to be like, ooh, yuck, you know? So they're following a trend, um, but they're following it at a time where they don't need that detail. Very Those astute are my thoughts. observations. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that was Did you prepare this good. in advance? Or? You asked wow. him, right? You asked him. <laughs> Uh, You're making no, us actually, all look terrible now. No, <laughs> no, I honestly have nothing to add to that. That's exactly what I would have said. <laughs> yeah. See, it's, yeah, James, James and I, James and I talked before this, and and he coached me through that response. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There it is. <laughs> right. Yes, That's because I good. often say perceived affordances. That's something I just throw out in <laughs> casual conversation. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw the Wikipedia link about affordances into this uh, the description at the bottom here, uh, along with a link to the book uh, Dave was talking about, so that if you're interested in uh, digging deeper into this stuff, you can actually educate yourself and so, give extremely profound answers like Dave just did. So I want to take, I want to take that, that, that question one step further. We, we, we see what Apple is doing in terms of responding to a trend, which is interesting because normally they're the ones setting it. I know when when the original iOS came out, everybody started making icons like that, you know, and making exactly. these rich, detailed icons. So they're responding to it a little bit. But however, there are a, there are more trends coming um, that have to deal with uh, the ways in which human beings interact with devices. Right now, um, as somebody said, we're touching flat pieces of, of glass, and that's not a very tactile thing. And um, you know, changes are coming. Is it, have you, uh, has anybody here got one of the Leap things yet? Yeah, I do. You, have you played around with it? Yeah. All right, so, so you, we're going to start having devices. I've heard it's challenging, <laughs> but, I mean, we're going to have it, different ways to connect with things. And, Dave, I'm curious from you, what do you see in terms of human interactions? How do you see uh, design compensating for all these different types of, of input that these devices have now? You have to Sure, sure. I, you know, I think that a lot of designers actually are going to be um, a, a bit. Uh, is everything still? Just make sure yeah, everything's yeah. So paused he, on. Yeah, he froze. End. I don't know why he froze. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> James is gone. Um, yeah, I, I think that that everyone has been fascinated for years with the Minority Report interface. Right, they, they, and and I think what a lot of people forget is that that is theater. Um, there was a director who said, "I need something that looks very, very dramatic. Stand yeah. here and make big, broad, sweeping gestures that that you know, and we'll we'll put a great soundtrack behind it that sounds ominous and like evil things are about to happen." Um, so it looks great on the screen. And sure, you know, when you said that you've got one of these leap motions, and I don't know if you've used it extensively or not, but what we're hearing from people is that they're kind of fun, but my arms get tired. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, holding, yeah, wow, something's going on. We just had two people drop out. <laughs> don't okay. come back. Don't worry. I think, I, think, I think I'm given the wrong answer here. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but welcome back, James. Uh, but uh, what I think a lot of people are failing to consider at this point in time with the with the spatial and gestural interfaces is that there are uh, there are real ergonomic concerns for yeah. these as input methods, and and you know as much as I like the idea of the leap motion, I don't see it yet in place as some type of a universal interaction mechanism or input mechanism because it's it's an invitation to repetitive stress injuries waiting to happen. 
Um, if you stand around waving your arms in the air for eight hours a day, you're going to screw up your elbow, your shoulders, and your neck. Um, and, and it's not designed for long-term ergonomic input. And um, this is? It's a little bit better. Um, you know, keyboards are not awesome either. You know, they're all artificial inputs. Um, but and that's why we have different shape mouse mice now. I mean, take a look at Engelbart's original mouse, a wooden box with you know gears on the bottom of it, and and think about the the Apple mistake, their round mouse. Yeah, I don't know if you remember that one. So we we're getting better about understanding the ergonomics of devices, but we still tend to contort our bodies to accommodate our machines. Um, and the Leap is just another one of those devices. Um, and, and not to say that it's all bad, because I think that there are times it works really well. Um, I, Connect and the Wii are great examples of, of spatial gestural inputs that are really effective, because they're using biological motions that are already natural to us, yeah. right? You swing a golf club, you let go of a bowling ball, you swing a tennis racket, you run in place. These natures that our bodies evolved for um, waving your hand at a at a monitor in front of you and making sweep and push and pull and 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 you know grab gestures in space are not something that that we do naturally and so the it's the artificial motions that are problematic for us ergonomically and what we need if we really want these to be effective interaction mechanisms is we need to figure out how to use them with natural motions that are already in our body's physical repertoire. Uh, the, the, my experience with that uh, leap motion was in, in many ways what you're saying that it's, um, it's a really cool idea but uh, the act of like basically what you have to do is you have to put your hand or your hands somewhere in front of you and then you have like a space that's about you know like half a meter by half a meter by half a meter in which you can right. do things so you're basically sitting there waving your hands in front of the computer and it can track your fingers and can actually see you do this which is really neat like you can actually there's yeah. some software where you can see what it sees and it's right. really neat that it can do that but then as you're doing it uh, you realize that these things that it wants you to do are actually super challenging. For example, there's a tool where you're supposed to be able to control your computer, and it's both for Windows and for Mac. And the idea is, when you're in the space, you, your finger becomes the mouse, and then you can move your finger around, and then you can see the mouse move around. And then to touch something, you have to move your finger forward. But since there's no actual tactile point where right. you are now touching, it becomes totally random. Then you're sitting there going, am I right. touching it now? Am I not? And then you're like, Urgh. and then what finally <laughs> happens is you'll end up like highlighting a page instead of moving it. And it's like, the demo is like, oh, look how easy it is. You just swipe up and down on the page and then it scrolls and then you do it in real life. And it's like, this is a total nightmare. I can't get anything right. And you're like <laughs> well, you deleting know, things of course, and they, closing they windows. They had takes and... on that, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, and but remember also that, that we are very in the very, very early age of, of any type of gestural interactions. So just like, yeah. you know, you mentioned the square box and it took a while to get the mouse right and we still haven't, you know, we're still refining that. Um, this as, a, as an interface type will be refined as well and I think we'll find what it works well for and what it doesn't work so well for. That's I, the key. I honestly think that right? it, this will work really well for certain types of things. Yeah. And, and when I was playing with it, I was like, why hasn't this been done? Like, for example, with Windows 8, you have all these charms that are things that come down from the top of your page or from the side of your page or from the bottom of your page that you can interact with your user interface, right? That would be perfect. You just sit there and type and you go, and then the charm comes out and you go, and it goes right. back, right? That makes sense. On Mac, it's the same thing. You can like slide your whole panel to the side to switch between apps. Same thing. Like if you if you were sitting there typing, and instead of having to grab your mouse and go like uh, on the mouse to make it work, if you can just like wave your hand and just throw the windows around, that makes sense. Right. And I can also imagine a lot of other user uh, scenarios that would actually be really cool. Uh, someone has made an, a MIDI controller for it. And it's really funny because I, I, a long time ago, was thinking it would be really cool if I could have some sort of device where I could hook it into my guitar and then hook my guitar into a MIDI controller and then wave around and then control the sound or, like, move my hand farther and closer to the guitar and, like, manipulate the sound. And basically what we have now with the Leap is the possibility to do that. You could literally just stick the Leap to your guitar 
yeah. and then like wave your hand in front of the guitar and it could control the sound that way, right? And there are people that are doing something similar with DJ sets, but the, the, the overall problem with it is, well, there are technical problems. You can't have a light directly above it, for instance, because then it gets confused because of all the IR that's happening. Uh, but uh, they haven't really figured out what this is for yet. It really is not a mouse replacement. That's the one thing that's absolutely established. You cannot use this as a mouse replacement. You will go insane trying. Uh, so right. it's right. for something else. Right. We uh, well, like you said, I mean, so the example that you gave with the with the media and the guitar, that it's like turning your leap motion into a theremin. Yeah, you know that yeah. the the electronic yeah. instrument, um, pretty much. Or you know, like like you can imagine, you're a researcher. You know, you're a biochemist or a molecular biologist or an organic chemist or something, and and you're looking at these really complex molecular structures that are spatial objects, and and if they were represented in a way that your gestures were allowing you to manipulate a spatial object as yeah. if you were holding it. Um, but that that once again that's that's mirroring what would be a natural motion for us you know I can imagine myself holding an enormous molecule and rotating it around and trying to get a look at the different angles and peek inside it to understand its structure and then if you um, combine that with an oculus rift which is this new uh, VR uh, oh, not thing that, that we're making uh, okay. which is, me but this one is back. this one is ridiculously uh, photorealistic, and I can totally see like you know uh, that kind of stuff in the past would have to do. You have to wear like a weird glove thing and be in a certain environment to do it. So yeah, for three D rendering and three D manipulation of things, if you combine a lot of these new technologies, you could get something really cool. But again, this right. is not. I just want a holodeck. That's that's <laughs> what I want. I want a holodeck. <laughs> How, you need how, to look up the Oculus Rift, app? dude. It's funny when you watch people play it. They 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 wear the Oculus Rift and they're playing like some sort of first person shooter, and they actually like fall over or because they <laughs> they they're so immersed in it and they see something and they go, oh, I can go lean on that, and then they try to lean on it, but it's in the virtual environment, so they just like crash onto the ground. <laughs> has, uh, has anyone it's here not even um, read the it's book really... uh, Ready Player One? Has anybody read it? No. Yes. That book is. That awesome. is an awesome book, and it talks. It's a you know, the, it's based, of course, on a on a, uh, a computer simulation, exactly like what you're talking about. You know, and they and I, I thought the author did a really nice job of describing the different types of rigs that people would buy so that they could enter this sort of immersive world. Yeah. But there's there is something there. Like if you start looking at all these things that are coming out, the Connect, the new Connect, the the Leap, which is actually being built into laptops right now. So you'll get laptops that have that functionality built in. You have TVs with gesture control. Uh, you get the Oculus Rift, which gives you, in theory, uh, almost photorealistic 3D universe that you're completely immersed in. And you're getting very close to this almost like lawnmower man thing. Yeah. You can imagine people like writing code in 3D and like flying around and throwing functions at each other. And then if you combine that with that new weird... Um, a programming environment? Oh, what the hell is it called? Uh, I sent it to you, Ray. Do you remember what it's called? Google Dart. Uh, there's this new programming environment where they're trying to visualize object-oriented programming uh, in, a, in a new way. And, uh, Sounds awful. Uh, it, 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 looks, it looks really like in, interesting, but I can totally see like if you, if you take that and you make it into a 3D environment and you have the... <laughs> <laughs> leap hooked up to it, and you can control the things and put them together and pull them apart. There is then you have Lawnmower Man in yeah. reality, <laughs> and you have a really bad movie on your hands. <laughs> Very poorly written code, I think. Yeah. So, do you think do you think that people are coming up with with these concepts of of new ways to work because they think it's an effective way to work, or because they see it in the movies? You know, that's a great question, and, and I think that, that really any solution that's actually going to work for us in the future is going to deal with the former instead of the latter, and, and I think sometimes people do bring forth technologies because it's either been envisioned in, previously in books or movies or it just, frankly, sounds cool, and, mm -hmm. uh, and they're not really thinking about how people are really going to interact with it. Right, yeah. right. Oh, one thing that I'm curious about is... Uh, what you think about maybe what we've lost now that Steve Jobs is gone and Apple, they seem to be allowing people to catch up to them. I mean, Google has made a lot of humongous strides towards getting, you know, essentially the place that Windows used to have 
the biggest sort of piece of market share in iOS. And you know, I'm I'm really wondering, you know, really from everybody, like, do you think that they've lost something now that Steve Jobs is gone? They seem to be sort of hunkered down, trying to work on a lot of different products. Nothing seems to be coming out. But um, you know, I think that perhaps we've lost something. But what do you guys think we've lost, or what do you think is different now that he's gone? You know, I think that that part of the appeal of the uh, so just my my opinion is that Apple is very good as a hardware company. They're okay as a soft company, yeah. um, and and they're not so good as as a functional ecosystems company. You know, like for example, it, it I have a few Apple devices I, as well, and it kind of bothers me that things like. I don't have any way of seeing photos that have been synced across iDevices via iCloud except on the iDevices. Like I have no web access to those photos, even though they allegedly are living somewhere in the iCloud. Um, and and it seems to me that 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 that's a failure of part of the ecosystem. Uh, stepping back to your to your original your original question, I I think that one of the things that Steve Jobs really, really brought to Apple was a mystique and an aura and mm -hmm. and and although certainly he was visionary in, in terms of the products, particularly you know, the iPod, the iPhone and the iPad. Um, but that that there's a limited number of product types that are that are possible. You're only going to get a revolutionary product every so often, but you can make it last as a revolutionary product for a long time if you have a really, really great campaign around it. Um, and and so I think one of the changes that we're seeing is not just on their products, but on their marketing messages. Like, think about it. Do the ads and stuff feel mm. as magical or as special to you? They and, seem and just like sort of other companies' ads. I mean, they really, that's one thing that I've noticed. Like, we had like the campaign with the Mac versus the PC. We had just other things that just, like you said, seem very magical. Now they seem like, oh, that's just another ad about touchy feely. Right. I mean, how yeah. Awesome the, the app had. Yeah, the, the risk in the risk in having a, a a revolutionary product that becomes very popular is that eventually it becomes common. Yeah. It's no longer revolutionary, and it's so to keep it. Side. Yeah, and, and and to keep it feeling revolutionary, you have to build a mystique around it. And and I think part of what we're seeing is that they're having a tougher time maintaining the mystique. Not necessarily that the products are getting any worse or that they're not moving forward. I think they're having a tough time maintaining the mystique because their products have become the standard. Their products are now the baseline. They're not differentiated or special. They are what everyone else achieves to be. And and it's you know you have to keep in mind that uh, Apple a lot of the Apple services that were pushed out like the uh, like uh, iTunes and things like that were actually just vehicles to make people buy the physical product and it seems like they went from that which was basically we have the iPod we want everyone to buy the iPod let's give them a service so that they get completely hooked on it and can't go anywhere else and then they started tacking on more of these services and now they've kind of become a service company even though they didn't really intend to be to begin with and they're not doing it as well simply because the hardware business is easy. You get people hooked on a specific type of hardware and they'll stick to it because it's hardware. When you do software, software has to be updated, has to be changed all the time, and people get annoyed with software updates. As you see with Microsoft, every time they do something, people flip a switch and go crazy, right? <laughs> and Apple is moving dangerously close to that now because when you see the, the reports that are coming out of people beta testing iOS 7, it is ugly. Like it's the type of stuff you normally see from Apple fans hacking on Microsoft, except now they're hacking on Apple instead. Um, I saw a post today about how a new version of it that came out, if you run an update, so you update all the apps, instead of the apps actually showing that they're being updated, they just get grayed out. And he was describing how he thought that something went wrong. And he like had to restart his iPad several times, and he figured out, oh, no, it's not going wrong. It's just that these apps get grayed out as if they don't work when they're being updated, but there's no indication that that's what's actually happening, right? And that kind of really harsh feedback is something that we generally don't see 
about Apple. What we generally see about Apple is, oh, if you hold a phone like this, it loses a signal. While only stupid people hold their phone like this, all good Apple users hold their phone <laughs> like this, right? That was like, yeah. I remember when that came out and people were like, well, it's not really an issue. It's just the way you hold your phone, right? And now yeah, they're saying... It, it honestly is just showing stuff that's all, that's been there for years. Um, yeah. I remember, I mean, you know, Apple did two things. Well, they did more than two things, but two major things over in the last the last decade or so. And the uh, first is they they reinvented the phone. You know, they 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 showed people what a phone really could and should be. Uh, and then they created uh, the tablet market. There were tablets already out there, but they're the ones that really, you know, I remember when I first saw the iPad, I was like, okay, so it's a big iPhone that can't make calls. Who wants that? Uh, yeah. It turns out lots of people want it. Um, like, cause, so I admit I didn't get it. But I remember I bought, I got one of the first, uh, the first iPhones, and um, I went to go sync my music. And I had a ton of music on my laptop, and I didn't have any on my phone whatsoever. And I got in and hit the sync button, and what do you think it did? Nothing. Crashed your computer. It erased all my music. Oh. Because <laughs> it did. Oh. It, erased, it erased all my music oh. and all my contacts because I told it to sync to the phone. And, I mean, the, number, the first rule of sync should be do no harm. And uh, Apple did not, uh, you know, and, and so, I mean, they do, they've been doing things for years that had Microsoft been doing it, they would have been lambasted. But the fact is, Apple had two things going for it. Number one, it was the anti-Microsoft, you know, for so long. And number two, they continued to innovate. Yeah. Now, when you have companies like Samsung, that could be argued that Samsung's actually pushing some innovations further than Apple is, Apple isn't being viewed as an innovator uh, or or as quite the innovator uh, anymore. And so because of that, those types of practices are beginning to, to come under scrutiny. Yeah, well, it you doesn't know, help that, also, okay. I was going to say, it doesn't help also that, that Apple has these these lawsuits where they're asking for things like Samsung should not be allowed to sell any products in the United yeah. States. It's right. like, <laughs> what? Right. Like they've trademarked squares. It, it's yeah. just, you know. They trademark rounded corners, things like that, yeah. Right. Yeah, I think in the in the past, you know, Apple has really done a good job in waiting to see when the technology and the UI have the perfect sort of storm of functionality. So they did that with the iPad, like everybody mentioned. I mean, I touch screens were around, you know, for a long time before that. I I think I remember like Burger King having like touch screens on there, yeah. you know, to order their Whoppers and all that, like for a long time ago. And the Surface came out. Palm Pilot had sort of touch with their little pens. Um, and it wasn't until the iPad came out that they got everything sort of right in a perfect storm. I really think perhaps that whatever Apple's next product will be is really going to show us whether they're still the same Apple. Whether it's, it's a watch. the watch that they're working on or it's, it's a the watch. TV it's a watch. that everybody said. Yeah, the you, and the same the thing watch. is happening. Everybody's coming out like you've seen the pebble. You know, and then the um, glasses you know, are coming, and then it's the like, glass, seriously? Right. You're just That's actually like, another thing that I wanted to ask Dave because last time... We talked about Google Glass before Google Glass had come out, and he had mentioned yeah. that, or I think they maybe they had just come out, and you were mentioning that you perhaps like we're going to see lots of people using. So, what are your thoughts on Google Glass and this whole idea of maybe wearable technology? Um, you know, I like I, I like the idea of it. I haven't had the opportunity. I really wish I'd had the opportunity to play with Google Glass, um, but I didn't put myself into that fifteen hundred dollar lottery for the for the mm -hmm. first wearers. I'm just waiting until someone lets me put theirs on. Um, and you live in the San other, Francisco. It's like half the city are wearing them. <laughs> you, you know, well, no, half the city someone. isn't. I've, I've actually only encountered a few pairs in in real life, oddly enough. Um, I haven't encountered too many of them around. Um, but, I, but I think a lot of the wearable computing stuff it actually shares a characteristic with the leap motion, and that is that... that a lot of these things are done because we can do it, and we're not entirely sure yet what need they're going to fill or what mm -hmm. purpose they're going to serve. And and I, not that I think it's bad. I think that it's nice having the exploration and to give people the opportunity to find a use for a product. Um, you know, I I think on the other hand, that's one of the reasons why it was like Ray, as you said, the perfect storm for Apple was that when they released the products, a convergence of technology, you know, so the, the 
the high high DPI screens and the the lithium polymer batteries with super high capacity and the Gorilla Glass for its strength um, and the and the much more refined touch glass technology so that you get much more responsivity. They had to wait until the low power processors got to a point where where they were fast enough to actually support what feels like instantaneous interaction. They pulled all of the, the bleeding edge technology together into a product, but they also identified for people when the product was launched that, that here are some needs it will fill. Right, so they are essentially content consumption devices. Tablets are, uh, and so when they were launched, it was it was focused on content. You know, FaceTime, talk to your friends. It was always about showing happy people in love uh, and grandkids across the nation. Um, watch your movies, read your books, play your games. You know, Apple didn't go out there. This is where Microsoft always makes its mistake. It goes out with everything has a productivity function. You know, look, you can do Excel on a tablet and everyone snores. <laughs> right. um, you know, Apple <laughs> says you you can stream HBO onto your tablet and, and yeah. people say, take my money and they throw it at the counter. <laughs> um, you know, so Apple had identified a feature. They had identified functions that these products were going to be good for. Um, and I think that's where, where Leap and Google Glass haven't yet touched the ground. The, they haven't identified how are these things really going to work for people in their daily life? How are we going to use it? Um, and right now Google Glass is essentially a really expensive small screen augmented reality experience. You know, it's like I can take a photo of what you're looking at, um, and I can give you data about something in your immediate environment upon request. Um, but I don't know yet, we won't know until people start wearing them, if that type of layered instant digital content, augmented reality, is a real need. People want to watch television. I don't know if people want to have <laughs> Yelp reviews flashing in front of their face as they're walking down the street. I know I don't. I only <laughs> want them when I want them. You know, and that's, I that's don't the trick. want one when Apple comes out with their Apple glasses. No, I mean that's. I think. I mean, Doug's right. That's the the trick is is um you know when when Doug Winnie was talking about this the other day, uh, he and I were having this conversation, and he was like, if they can if they can aug change it so that you know those features are on only when I want them on and you know are easy to enable then you know that that type of augmented reality makes sense but right. is, it, is it really that much more difficult for me to pull up my phone st you know stop walking for a second pull up my phone pull up Yelp and find stuff than it is to go to my glasses and turn a switch or look a certain way or I, you know I, I don't you know I don't know that, that that it's worth that much more to me and to to have it sort of layered over the reality well, there's I'm, some. I'm, go, oh, ahead. go ahead. I was going to say, but remember, there, there's content transmission and there's content collection. So we could also be yeah, taking true. the photo and true. video of our experiences. Um, it's not just a matter of delivering content. It may also be that the primary use turns out to be something about capturing our lives right. rather than supplementing them. And you guys are going to laugh at me when I say this, but I really don't mean this as a joke. My generation isn't that narcissistic, but the one that follows me is. <laughs> and yeah, I don't, I don't this, right? it, but I mean, so you know, I, I, from, worry, like, I did uh, not grow up. Had on all times. I did not grow up tweeting everything that I was doing or going to Facebook and posting status updates about. If you look, if you look at the 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 Facebook feed of of say a teenager or somebody in their early twenties, as opposed to somebody that is <clears throat> my age, um, you see a stark difference. You know, I will post something on Facebook maybe once every two weeks. You know. And 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 it's it's very it's not it's never, yeah. Whereas other people will say, you know, hey, I just got back from the nail salon. I just did this. I, you know, I just and it's kind of like okay. my underwear. I did laundry. Yeah. Literally, James is reading my uh, Facebook feed very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> I just rendered some steel fat. You know? No, yeah, yeah. More, Morton. Screamers are gross. Had another screamer. I can't believe I tried screamers again. Actually, <laughs> yeah. actually I have those arguments with people on Facebook all the time about peanut butter and chocolate and screamers, and it's insane how angry people get whenever I say it. I say it as often as I can. Yeah. So, so, so I don't one of the problems. My, oh, uh, 
I don't see that type of functionality being really something that I would even even want. Um, yeah. But I, you know, I, I know that there's a, a whole generation of people coming behind me that would probably think that that would be amazing. So yeah, is the I was going to say maybe you're not the market. The, not. So is the problem that the people at Apple that are working on it now are too old to understand <laughs> what the young people actually want. No, I don't think they no. are too old. I think they no, are some think really so. tremendously talented people. That I don't think Apple's lost its mojo. I don't, you know, just because Steve is is gone, um, you know, I don't think, you know, they they still have some amazingly talented people working for them, and they're still going to yeah. create. You know, I, you know James, I I agree with you, but I think the problem is that there's all these products that Apple hasn't released that people sort of have known about and have found out about, like the watch and the TV. Yeah. That that people are wondering, like, okay, there's really just nothing new coming out from Apple, just you know, evolutionary, slight evolutionary steps, nothing big. However, we do have a product that they released that is wildly different and that's also very controversial that's released after Steve Jobs came out. And, and I'm talking about the Mac Pro. It's a wildly different, you know, yeah. Pro machine. And I think that thing? if you look at... Yes, the chimney thing. And I think that if yeah, you that look at awesome. that machine, it's going to tell you whether whether or not Apple really has lost this mojo. And, and, I, don't, and I don't think they have. Uh, and I, this is sort of, to me, like classic, typical Apple. They redefine a category. They say you no longer need to have large internal, you know, cases that you plug in cards into. I'm curious to to see what uh, Dave thinks about the Mac Pro and perhaps maybe what it says about where Apple is. Because it really is the latest thing that Apple has released that's different than anything else and that maybe shows us a little bit of how they're thinking. Sure. You know, I, once again, it's a it, it is it's a hardware device, right? So it, it's not it, it's not a revolutionary change in in their ecosystem or in their software. It's in it's in something that they've built, which I think plays to their strengths, as we talked about earlier. Um, I don't have any personal experience with it yet. I've seen I've seen the device and I've seen you know the the dissection in the photos and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be honest with you. My first thought about it was that the most revolutionary thing in its design is that someone decided that they would borrow aero, aerodynamics and engineering from jet engines. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, but see, I think, I think that was James's probably same reaction with the iPad. Like, oh, that looks like a bigger iPhone, you know, that I don't know that anybody would need. But they've done a couple of things that are controversial, like, you know, for example, you know, getting rid of any internal storage, you know, going to, like, Flash storage. I mean, these are these are pretty big things that are, people are like wondering what the heck. Eliminating CD drives or DVD drives. Yeah, they did that yeah, a while well, back. I mean, I mean, you know, but but hey, Ray, it's not unusual for them to make a misstep either. Uh, you remember yeah. the cube? Yep, I sure do. But that was that was the old Apple. This is a <laughs> was the old uh, Apple. It was this, no, this I think damn Apple. Apple. <laughs> it was the same Apple. Apple. No, I think I think it, I think no. It, like my point is. We haven't really seen any of the new stuff they're working on, but this is something that right now, at least, that it's sort of current, and so you can see what they're doing here is the way that they're thinking about product, and so they've released this thing, and it's the closest thing we have that is brand new, that's trying to be a little revolutionary in some ways, that shows us, you know, they're still thinking a certain way, so perhaps it's, this tells us a little bit about how they're thinking about the, yeah. the other products that we don't but see. I, I, I think the, the issue is that Apple is no longer the underdog. You know, if you go back just a few years in time, people still felt like, you know, if you're if you're like an Apple person, you're kind of, you know, the cool one that has like the cool stuff and there's a lot of people who don't get it, you know. Most people don't get it. They just don't understand it. If you get someone converted to Apple, you're like, oh yeah, you're finally getting it, right? Now it's more like Apple is just one of those things, and people, you know, you go to you used to go to places and you'd see like a hundred thousand iPhones and two other things. Now you go to the same event, you see a hundred thousand Android devices and some iPhones. And what I see a lot of is people that Apple users looking over at the iPhone, on the other phones and going. Oh, that's much bigger than mine, or that has that thing that I can't do, right? And I, I saw someone doing, I don't know if you've seen it, but this actually relates to the Leap. I forget which one it is. I think it's the S4. Oh, yeah, where you wave your hand over it? Yeah. You, you don't have to touch it. Yeah, and it's really Samsung. Fun. And the new uh, Sony phone, that's waterproof. So you don't need to get a $50 case or $100 case for your phone. You just buy your phone and throw it in the ocean, 
and it'll work just <laughs> fine, right? And or it, it, you know that sounds totally ridiculous, but consider this: uh, my uh, wife's cousin has a baby, and she has a waterproof uh, case for her iPhone simply because the baby is not a baby; it's like a toddler. The toddler keeps taking her phone and throwing it in the toilet, and it's not—I don't know why he does that, but that's what he does. And he throws it in the toilet. Quit giving the toddler the, the phone. Yes. yes. He keeps taking the phone and tossing it in places where it shouldn't be, including a lot of water-filled places like the sink, the toilet, outside, whatever. And I the think the larger problem there, Morton, is parental supervision of the toddler. Well, it, it's, it, <laughs> when Says I started thinking curmudgeon. about it, I, I was thinking this is actually something that I think about all the time. Like when I'm jogging, I have to like keep my phone away from my pants because I sweat too much, and then the sweat goes into my phone. If I um, was outside and it was raining, like in Vancouver, where it rains all the time, I have to think about where I put my phone so that it doesn't get wet. Because I had a phone that just died when I was outside because it was raining, and the rain just seeped in and killed my phone, right? And a waterproof phone is actually something that no one has done before, and it's super smart, and it's probably going to become more and more... Um, like uh, common, but that's the kind of innovation we see now. It's not that I invented a whole new thing. It's more like I took this thing and I solved the problem that people have. People keep buying this thing that costs a hundred dollars to tack on to the thing to solve the problem. So why don't I just solve the problem, right? And I think that's perhaps what uh, what Sam Samsung and other companies are good at, and not something that Apple's really you know awesome at. They're really good at creating maybe creating new categories and leading those categories, but not at making small changes. Because uh, they tend to wait until those changes are good. Well, I think also I, I think there's also a, a certain elitism in in Apple design. There are certain things okay, that they yeah. they mm -hmm. they don't want to do because it's going to take away from from the aesthetic of their product. So if they were to have made the iPhone waterproof, it might have needed to be bigger or thicker or heavier. And they were those were sacrifices they weren't willing to make because they had set mm -hmm. standards for themselves on certain things. Uh, now, yeah. granted, I think I, those standards serve a purpose, right? There's there is a, there's a quality component to the Apple products, um, and there there is certainly a service component involved. You know, if something is wrong and you take your device to a genius bar, they're actually pretty good about fixing it or exchanging it or replacing it. You hear stories all the time about people saying, "Got a new iPhone, got a new Mac Air, got a new what." Ever because something went wrong, yeah. um, and you're paying for that in the price point. But you're also paying you're you're buying into the Apple aesthetic when you do that, and they just don't want to violate their aesthetic that they would have to violate to provide some of these features. Yeah, I think okay. if you look, at, you know, one thing that I was thinking about. I'm sorry, is that if you look at the the current Apple, the thing that I call the new Apple, the one thing that's really sort of uh, capture what they're thinking about for me is their new ad campaign actually. We're talking about ad campaigns before, but they have this new ad campaign where they talk about this is our signature and it means everything. And it's, it's designed by Apple in California. So I was wondering what oh, you guys thought about that. I mean, it really the, spells out what they think. This is what about matters the experience that of a say product. Things like Just more every, there are more photos taken by the iPhone than by any other camera. And this ad that's just getting so much flack uh, the one where it uh, says, no. what matters is the product, and then they show a bunch of people not interacting with other people, but with the product instead. You're right, right. Is that what you mean? No, I'm actually, well, I think I'm talking about the ad, the, this ad. I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's the same, and, I, and we're talking about different things. But um, the thing about this ad is that you read exactly what the manifesto for Apple is. This is it. This is what matters, the experience yeah, of the product, right. how it makes someone feel. Yeah. Will make life better. Does it deserve to exist? We spend a lot of time doing a few great things, you know, until everything we do enhances. Life. This is what Apple thinks. This is what they think they, they do. So yeah, I thought it was a great It's the same ad. Yeah. Uh, yeah so I, I have big problems with that ad simply because it's truly supplanting human interaction with a product. It's, it's it literally yeah. saying it's what Edward matters. Humphrey. What matters is not what you do but that you have the right product when you do it. That's the actual think, message. We'll post it, both it those is. articles so that people can read them side by side and see what they think, because <laughs> they're completely like diametrically opposed. I know, but I mean, I think that, I think that Apple is saying is, this is what they think. This is the, what Apple represents right now. Hmm. Um, and I think they did it, to me, effectively. I don't know, maybe 
maybe Dave and, and uh, James can actually pitch in and. and can well, if you if, if if you want to sell your stuff, that's the message, right? Yeah. That, Apple's that, a company that wants to sell their stuff. Exactly, that's the message. But if you're if you're a humanist and and you want to make sure that that people are are fulfilling their potential and that they are self-actualizing themselves, and then you then you take the position that Fast Company did, and and that was, why would you want a room full of people texting each other when they could be standing around talking face to face? Yes, but that's um, like that's know. that's the way things are now. Like you go to lunch, nobody's talking to each other. They're tweety. They're. I mean, I know that maybe he's not the best thing in the world, but that's just the reality, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, and you know, but it, but I think I, I Dave think and if I went we to dinner look the other at, night, we had a lovely discussion, and I don't believe we either of us texted uh, once, did we? You're too <laughs> old, James. <laughs> <laughs> you exactly. said so. Based yourself. on your Facebook, based on yes. your Facebook account, apparently you don't count. <laughs> Yes, no. yeah, I, I think I, I, I still think that sometimes our our time uh, uh, our view across periods of time is too short to understand yeah. what's happening. I think that a lot of the devices, because they are new, because they are pervasive, we have not developed social and cultural norms for when and how to use them. Um, that they are that they are in fact really changing social interactions. Um, they're disruptive. They're disruptive, but that doesn't mean that they're all that this is the new norm. That this is the right. new standard. Yeah. That it that it's a it, we're on a pendulum. And we swung in one direction, and as happens with most you know pendulums, we swing too far until we start to turn around and drift backward. So I I think that the fast company article is pointing out that we have become obsessed with our devices as a way to stay in contact with people when there are, are better ways for us to stay in contact as humans than, than text messages. And, and we'll see in some cases things start to swing back. We're going to live with a few generational effects of this. Um, you know, James and I will will never probably join that crowd. We'll I'll be capable totter off of having, into the sunset. Yeah, well, but you know, but they're going to look at us as old-fashioned because we'll actually be able to sit down, have a meal, drink a glass of wine, and talk to one another without the 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 cool blue glow of a screen illuminating us from the table. Um, you know, but I don't know. Two, three generations from now, what will mm -hmm. we have settled into? What what new patterns? Uh, Everybody, go read the book. Too short. Every Everybody, go read the book. You are not a gadget. If you haven't read that book yet, you need to. You need to read it. You um, are not a gadget. You're not a gadget. Yeah. Have you read that one, Dave? No, I haven't. I haven't even heard of that one. Who wrote it? Uh, let me link here. A manifesto is written by Jaron Lanier. There you go. You got it. Oh, yeah. I heard about this on a very awesome radio show that in Canada is called. Spark on CBC. Yeah, he is a he's a he's a futurist among other things, but uh, yeah. but it's a it's a fantastic book about what it means to be human in the age of of pervasive gadgets and pervasive technology, ah. and uh, and about commoditizing humanity. You know that you're you're more than just you know money for Facebook things yeah. like that. And it's it's not it's not a, a a cry against technology by any means it's 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 basically redefining what it means to be human in this type of, of world so it's a great book and, and everybody should read it, it so it, all of us that work in this industry should read that book so uh, on on the topic of like devices that are doing things to us uh, I'm, I'm faced with a very interesting conundrum right now um, uh -oh. because uh, that's right you haven't got to ask your question yet Oh, no, we'll save that for next week. It's not going to go away anytime soon. <laughs> yeah. Stay tuned for next week when we'll talk about really controversial stuff with James Williamson. Um, yeah, yeah, I won't, on, I won't bring uh, up my topic yet either. Uh, we'll, I'll save that for next week. <laughs> we'll save it. This, Dave yeah. is providing I, I, way I, too I, much quality I, information for us to befuddle that's it right. garbage. And, and I've, I, I want to talk about should UX designers code at some point. <laughs> well, we're, we have five minutes left, so we have to save that for next time. Yeah, we'll, we'll save it for a future that is visit. really important. No, I can discussion. answer that in five. Yes, there you go. Do, you, boom, boom, done. You know, actually, actually, we, we actually um, could continue this next week. We actually don't have a, somebody scheduled, so it would be actually awesome to. Oh, 
Oh, well, unfortunately, we'll un unfortunately, I'm going to be helping my mother move, sell her house. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, we'll have you back man. another time. Come on, what a terrible yeah, excuse. Yeah, we'll have to find... Help your mother. I know. Move. I'm. I'm going to be doing a, a cross country road trip with with my mother. We're going to be Colorado, driving right? from. Uh, she's going to be moving from Pennsylvania to Colorado. Wow. Yeah. Holy crap. So next That's week, exciting. I'm I'm going to help her uh, sell the house, pack up, and then drive across country with her. Well, then we'll have to schedule you for some time in the near future to talk about UX designers coding and. Uh, uh, Pixel perfect designs. So oh, anyway, yes. I, I, I actually really want to get to this uh, point. Yes, Martin has an important point to make. Shut up, James. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> that was our, dy our dystopian future. So, okay, sorry. Yeah. So uh, the the conundrum is this: as you can see, I work from home. I have a home office, and I spend an insane amount of time in front of my computer well, and true. because I work from home when I don't like I get up in the morning I get breakfast I walk downstairs I work I walk upstairs to have like, I could literally spend a week in my house right yes. and the only way you I get outside to do something still. yeah I, I'd have to like actively remove myself from the house to get something done now that's fine when it's summer it's not fine in Vancouver when it's not summer because it rains constantly right so I'm trying to figure out a way of becoming more active. And one of the ways to do that, and a lot of my friends are doing that now, is they get one of these fitness tracker things, like the Fitbit or the Fitbit, yeah. Flex or whatever yeah. on their arm that basically reminds them what they're, that they're not being active enough, right? So it's a really tricky situation because on the one hand, I know I'm not active enough and I know I need to go outside, but on the other hand, it's really hard to justify doing that because I'm so immersed in what I'm doing. And uh, a device like that might trigger some sort of either mm -hmm. guilt response or a competitive response that would then result in me being more active. But in then at theory. the same time, you ask the question, you really need a piece of plastic on your arm to tell you that you have to go for a walk, right? Sometimes, sometimes yes. Sometimes we need that, that external motivation. Um, there's a... There's a, a, a professor at, at Stanford, B.J. Fogg, F-O-G-G, um, who years ago, actually, you, you might have encountered him years ago because he did a lot of work um, on establishing credibility and trust on the web. Uh -huh. uh, and in the, in, in the past several years has changed his, his research focus and now does a lot of uh, work talking about tiny habits. So if you just do a quick web search for B.J. Fogg and tiny habits, um, you'll see that he's doing a lot of research on how to people achieve large changes in their behavior through incremental steps yeah. and, and what are some of the tools and mechanisms and sometimes these external cues are what we need to jumpstart behavioral change. But if you think about it, it's so crazy. It's like we developed this environment that we're all immersed in. We basically work on computers all day. Uh, w what we do is produce stuff that makes other people work on computers every day. Uh, we've now simplified it so that you don't even have to go to work through the use of computers. And now you need technology to remind you that you need to be a human. You, like, you're not designed <laughs> to sit in a chair and hack at a keyboard all day. You're actually designed to I'm, walk I'm, around and do we're, stuff. We're sorry. I mean, you know, I, I hate to I hate to say this, but I mean, I, <laughs> Ray, <laughs> I can I can see having technology it's help future, you. More than... I, I can see having technology help you meet a certain goal. Like I use the site called My Fitness Pal um, yeah. because I had a hard time counting calories. So I, using My Fitness Pal, I would just type in what I eat, and it would tell me how many calories I was currently you know shoving down my gullet, and uh, and that was that was awesome. Um, but if you're having to have technology remind you to get out of the chair. To me, that's a time management issue, and you maybe need to th might think about, okay, from this period of time, no matter what I'm into, I'm going to turn the computer off, and I'm going to go outside, and I'm going to look at a tree, and I'm just going to just look at the tree for a little while and check it out and say, what an awesome tree, and then I might run around the house two or three times. You need to force yourself to have that time, because if you don't, uh, I don't, I don't know about you, but I get burned out. If, if I've had those weeks where, you know, from like 8.30 in the morning until – Two in the morning, you know, I'm I'm working and I I don't I barely leave the computer and I'll do that for like five or six days straight. When those days happen, I'm I'm burned out. Yep. You know, I just I lose my passion for it. You know, so I think you you just have to to force yourself to unplug. 
you have to you have to find find your pace. You know, we're we're we are not intrinsically rational. We we can sit here and talk about this, and we can say, I know I need to get up and move around, but in the end, it's easier to just sit here and watch YouTube videos of cats. Well, you saw what I was working <laughs> on, right? So, so you can see how like it's extremely immersive. So I can't I can't let go of it, and then it's like I get up and I'm like, holy crap, it's seven p.m. <laughs> what I know what you mean, but you know that's a, I think one of the problems is that you probably have a personality like mine. You know, it's sort sort of obsessive compulsive. Like you just want to finish the thing that you started, and yeah. that makes it really hard to get away sometimes. So you know, I used to have a fuel bed until my baby bit off the electronics, so that was sort of tough. But the right. one thing that it did do for me is it it really told me how little I was moving during the day. Yeah. Like I really had no idea that I wasn't moving that much. And it really wasn't, to, to me, like, it's not the calories that I'm consuming. It's the fact that I can consume extremely little calories and still live and gain weight yeah. because I don't move any. any but did any, it make you, know, you move more? It, it, yeah, I think it, when I had it, or it Or did it you just really stop working? Or ignore no, it? No, I, no, I, no, I, it literally, it would just, at the end of the day, it would say, you only have 1,000 fuel points. And I'm like, man, I'm supposed to have, like, twice that much. So it really made me start to like do more things to make sure that I reached a you know a normal goal of you know however many fuel points, which is like I think two thousand you're supposed to have. So it just made me think about it and probably caused my compulsive brain to go, I need to be doing stuff instead of just sitting here. So I think while I had it, I think it was really helpful in that respect. You know, well, we're, we're taking guys. nuggets too, so. I'll keep you guys posted on where this goes, and then if I actually end up getting one, I'll tell you if it works or not. You could always <laughs> hook your computer up to a generator and then tie that generator to a treadmill, and that way to be on the computer, you have to run on the treadmill. Right, or or I've seen people, I've seen, uh, people do that with televisions and exercise bikes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but I like yeah. outside. I so. do too. I'll, I'll hook my computer to my bike, and then I'll ride around and code at the same time. Yeah, what I about now, Google so. Glass? <laughs> yes, and I'll speak. Put on your Google code Glass into. and go for a walk. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, we are uh, full time, so uh, we'll have to let it go and see what happens when we pick up this conversation later on. And um, thank you all for joining me. Uh, thank you, Ray thank and you. James, and especially Dave. Fun Honestly. as always. I look forward we'll to another future visit. We'll have to get you back visit. to talk yeah, about all this other stuff that we're going to talk about. I, I want to get deeper into perceived affordances. Yeah, I know. Okay. There's there's way too much material here. We need to. We need yeah, to have and and shortly. I want to at some point I want to talk about things you know like the future of voice recognition and artificial intelligence and oh yeah, my all kinds God, of stuff. Yes. Yes. This damn thing, my Nexus <laughs> phone. I have a sinus infection. It does not understand anything of what I say because I'm stuffed up. Seriously, <laughs> voice recognition, my ass. It's your fault, not the phone. Don't blame the hardware. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to hit end broadcast. Uh, tune in again next week while we'll have uh, more stuff to talk about. So thanks for watching. Bye.